if you would please, and I want you to, I want you to first go to Philippians, and I want to look at the fourth chapter. I want to title this tonight, Don't Look Back. It's time for the church to really step up and not look. We spend so many, th- how many people have ever heard say, I gave up this for Jesus, and I gave up that for Jesus, as if they did God some great, awesome thing. I mean, Lord, do you realize what I gave up for you? Well, Paul called it all garbage. So you gave up garbage. That's all you had prior to Christ, was trash and garbage. So we don't look back on the trash and garbage, but rather and we, look, we look forward to the excellency of the things of God. <clears throat> Paul writes in chapter 4, in verse 6, and this is where I want to begin this, because when we are moving forward as believers, we need to make a decision about how we're going to stand on a daily basis how we're going to walk through these crises, through these situations, how we as the church are going to trust God at a whole new level, begin to trust his word to be explosive and powerful at a whole new level, how we're going to raise up or raise up to the higher level so we can be more effective for God in this season than ever before. Every, every time we have a new level, we have new devils, but, but new devils is another level. We keep going from glory to glory, higher to higher. And the church, we must move forward and upward in this season. So here's what Paul writes to that church. He says, be anxious for nothing. That is an emphatic. Be anxious for nothing. That is a direct word from God to, def- to, to defeat the power of fear and anxiety that try to sweep across believers sweep across multitudes of millions of lives. And God says, rather, in its place, I want you to get this word down in your spirit. He says, be anxious for nothing, but positioned in everything. I need you by prayer and with intercession. I need you to make known your request before God. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So you know what you need? You need a victory of God. You know what you need? You need a peace of God. You know what you need? You need the healing power of God. You know what you need? You need the breakthrough of God. You know what you need? You need the kingdom of God. So he says, what I need you to do is not let anxiety and stress control you, but rather you need the peace of God and the kingdom of God, somebody say peace of God, and the kingdom of God to control you. See, Jesus said back in John's gospel, peace I leave with you, my peace, the peace I have with my Father. That that powerful thing that you and I get now because of the reconciliation, I have access to the very peaceful presence of God. And that peace says that God is so in control. Somebody say in control. So he says, therefore, let your requests be made known to God. So instead of anxiety driving you, let the peace of God drive you. And notice he says, and then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding going to guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Church, we have a a phenomenal weapon here. When the Bible says that we can have confidence in the peace of God, that means our prayer, our intercessions, our standing in the gap for a nation, for a generation, for your life, for your home, for your soul, for people. The fact that we are standing boldly in the gap. And the Bible says with thanksgiving, which means, Father, I thank you you're going to meet the need. Father, I thank you the breakthrough's coming. Father, I thank you the healing is on its way. Father, I thank you your kingdom will be demonstrated. Somebody say hallelujah. How many kingdom-hungry people do I have in the house? I'm going to say this a thousand thousand times. We ain't ready for rapture yet. Church is not rapture time. It's power time. The body of Christ has, has yet to be seen. Has yet to be seen in this generation. The authority of God and the demonstration of God is yet to be seen. Now, what we need to do is make sure we're not going to look back. So, let's, so, so at the same time, let's go back in our Bibles Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 16. And what I want you to do is I want you to look, I want you to see how Paul and Silas could not look back but had to stand their ground and move forward. Hold on just a second. You know what you do with that thing? You stand right underneath it. Yes, it does. Or you fix the battery. Sorry, we got to, as you can all see, that's on behind me and, and it's kind of a distraction. Nothing we can do about it. All right, you can't see, but then why can I see yet? 
I can see something you cannot see. So shh, don't look behind me. Stay here. No distraction going on. All right, book of Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Paul and Silas had to make a decision. They are going to move forward. Somebody say forward. Listening to the Holy Spirit, they are going to move forward. Present circumstances always meant keep moving forward. And the Bible says when they had gone through Nigeria and the region of Galatia, the Holy Spirit, by the word of wisdom, forbade them to preach the word in Asia. He didn't say don't preach the word. He said don't preach the word in Asia. And if God says no to this, that means he's got something else he's saying yes to. Somebody say hallelujah. Our moving forward is always finding that vein in which God is moving. And if, and if this is a no, then somewhere over here is a yes. If this is a red light, somewhere over here is a green light. Because God's kingdom is always being advanced. Because I'm going to learn how to walk. I'm not going to look back. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to make intercession, supplication, because I know God's going to provide. So I need to understand that God's leading. That's why this is vital. He's, because this letter that, that he wrote in Philippians, he's writing to a church which has known great opposition. And we go back on the book of Acts, we see that this great opposition coming against this church is because of a power move of God that birthed this church. Somebody say hallelujah. God birthed this. This was a God work. This was a God deal. And when God is involved in the work, hallelujah, all glory is on your side. Doesn't matter what hell don't like, doesn't matter what hell thinks, but every time you're in the will of God, you are suddenly a radical threat to the kingdom of darkness. And the Bible says that they kept moving, therefore they came to Messiah. Now, now, they understood the leading of the Holy Spirit. And church, that's one of the things we must re-engage in our relationship for the leading of the Holy Spirit. We don't get offended if he doesn't move this way. We don't get offended if he doesn't move this way. That means that there is a direction he wants to move. God has a direction and what he's asking you to do is to be sensitive at that moment, at that place and time, because God doesn't have to give you 30 years from now. All he's got to give you is the next step. All he's got to give us is the next step. And these guys had a plan. But in the plan, they were listening to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had a great big plan. All he needed them doing was moving forward so he could address them in the matter. And the Bible says, and they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Isn't it amazing? God keeps saying, no, 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 no. Don't get offended. Because God, every time God says no, he keeps you moving in another direction. He's moving you closer and closer to the next level of breakthrough in your life. And here, God had something he wanted to build, something he wanted to start, a whole new dimension. Paul had wanted to go to Ephesus. And the Holy Spirit's got, are you kidding me? I got an entire new dimension of churches I want to explode that you don't even realize I'm about to do. So I'm going to lead you in a whole new way, if you're willing to let me guide you as the body of Christ in this season, church, if we'll let the Holy Spirit guide us away from our traditions and the way we've been doing things and don't get offended because there's problems and let the Holy Spirit guide the church through these waters. We're going to move into a whole new place we've never been in faith before in our lives. We have yet to see the power of God demonstrated as we know God wants to demonstrate. That's why there's no boohooing in this. Even though it's struggle, even though it's stressful, the Holy Spirit has got this. And the church will keep listening. He will lead us into the way we are to preach, speak, minister, and flow. Your whole ministry is about to change, Pastor. And you need to let your ministry change. You need that the Holy Spirit suddenly make your ministry, hate to say it, effective. Or at least more effective. Don't want to offend anybody. I probably did. So passing by, in a vision, verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. It was a man of Macedonia, a great word of wisdom. And the man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. We want you to go in this direction. Somebody say this direction. The Spirit of God gave them such a clarity because he understood the opposition to the vision and the message they were about to operate in. Even though Paul was about to see a great church built, there was going to be opposition. So he had to be listening. Somebody, somebody again say listening. Now Paul was no, was no novice to opposition. His, whole, his last missionary journey he'd gotten stoned in. And I mean with rocks. Okay? He'd gotten, he'd gotten beaten and stoned in his last missionary journey. And here he is pressing in again. 
He's not stepped back from the leading of the Holy Spirit because he knows that the message he has is the perfect power message of heaven. It is the power of God to salvation, which is what he would write to the church at Romans. So Paul and Silas, they were going to plow through because they had such an inward witness that says this is where God wants to go. And when you've got the glory and the anointing of God, and God's going to lead you, that means God's about to demonstrate someone's life is about to be touched. Something is about to be changed. Are you ready for God to use you to change somebody's life? So they made a decision. So after this, they'd seen the vision. They, they believed it was God who had called them. Verse 17, and they sailed right out over there. Is what they did on the Sabbath day. Verse 13, they went out and they found a whole group of people out there. And they began to build a local church. Somebody say local church. Now the local church was right in the middle of devils, demons, and darkness. It was in the middle of every kind of cultic activity you can imagine. They were worshiping everything. They were seriously, openly worshiping everything but God. There were temples of this idol. There were temples of that, you know, to that idol. There were priests to all these temples. There were sacrifices. There's adultery, fornication, everything. There was everything in hell is moving. And yet, when they step over to there, God gives them favor, and they begin a house church that is growing and growing and growing and growing. People are coming in. People are being swept into the kingdom to the point where it's beginning to cause a problem in the city. Because the church is getting too big, obviously, or there wouldn't have been opposition. There had to have been a strong anointing. The glory of God, think about that. All these devils and demons are being pushed back as this church of the Lord. And we're talking about a power church. Somebody say power church. It wasn't some dead religious institution. This was power happening right in the middle of all, of all that hell had built. And here is this church growing. And here the devil sends this girl, and she's demon-possessed. And she's following Paul around in silence, and she's mocking them, and she's making fun of them, and she's calling out about them. I mean, she just, and you can discern. Somebody say discern. You got to listen. Whenever you're going to be effective for God, you got to know when what's being said is of God or from the pit of hell. There's something going on which is grading your spirit. And you know what's being said and done is not by the Holy Ghost. That's why, church, the gifts of the Spirit are extremely for the day. You need the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of the Spirit. You need to be able to discern what's taking place. We cannot engage this season without knowing the sound and the voice of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be effective in this season unless we truly decide to become supernatural in our relationship with God get on fire again with God, and get full of the Holy Ghost because that's the only way we're going to bring things through and navigate this season for this nation and a generation. So here's this girl, and she's doing all of her thing in this verse 18, and she did this for days. And Paul, for whatever reason, was trying to hold off the engagement because he seemed to know that this girl was producing multiple dollars for all kinds of people out there which were using her for dollars and dimes because she was prophesying money right out of people. And they just, and this was the last demon he wanted to deal with at this moment because he had this church going. Well, he had about enough. Somebody say enough. We got to get to the point when it's time to engage. And when we know we engage, we are ready for the fight once we engage. Just don't attack every devil out there unless you're ready to attack the devil out there. But when you're ready to attack the devil out there, attack the devil out there. Paul was ready. Somebody say ready. Paul was ready. And he went after that thing, snap, cast that thing out of that woman, and it wasn't a half a day, and they were thrown in prison and beaten for the fact that they set this girl free. Understand, because they knew where they were, because they'd heard the wisdom in the heart of God, they were where they belonged to be. There was a vital church sitting there, growing into things of the kingdom while they sat in prison. God had done a marvelous work. Lives had been saved. The church was growing, and they were in prison, so they were not boo-hooing about what had just taken place, but rather they were with, without, with anxious for nothing. But with thanksgiving and everything, they were making thanks to God that God was going to bring them through. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, is going to guard you. And that's where they were at in that prison. They were exercising the very word that they were going to write to that church just 
few years down the road. And they stood in that prison knowing they were in the place of God, in the position of God. And though they were now going through a trial from the, from the very hordes of hell, they knew that where they were, God had them because they were in the place of faith. And they stood the ground with such thanksgiving, with such praise that you know the story, all of heaven responded. Boom! God shook the earth. God shook the prison. Knocked the doors right off the hinges. The leaders and the magistrates were terrified. And Paul and Silas were allowed to go free. And the church was left unmolested because of the demonstration of the presence of God. Now the church is still in the midst of every devil, demon, and darkness. But God had just shook everything. So they were going to back away from that little church in Lydia's house, which was now growing and growing. So when we get to this letter, we need to understand how to stay the course because we're not looking back. What God had done and what God had started, you don't want to lose. Say, I don't want to lose it. We don't want to lose what God has started. Don't let old things begin to become the new things in your life. The Bible tells you that all old things do what? Pass away, right? And all things become new, don't they? That's what the Bible wants you to do. That's what the Word of God says. All old things pass away. This was a new group of believers, God-hungry believers, that, according now, let's turn to Philippians chapter 1, that they were birthed, they were strengthened, they were equipped, they became useful, and they stayed connected. Somebody say stay connected. They stayed connected with Paul through his trials, to his oppositions as he moved down in there through Berea, then down into Thessalonica, and ultimately down into Corinth. All the places that Paul would go. This church was so vital to him that they sowed into him again and again and again. Why? Because he was in the right place. And they were now the, they were the offspring of obedience. Full of the faith of God. Full of the power of God. And staying right alongside Paul every way they could. That's why you look at chapter 1. The Bible says, I'm confident, verse 6, look at this. I'm confident of this very thing. Now Paul in prison is writing back to the church in the opposition. And he's challenging and encouraging the church because of what he, listen, the signs or the, or, the, or the signs of the apostle were on him, and that was the beatings, that was strife, that was opposition, the things that proved his apostolic authority wasn't just signs, wonders, and miracles. It was the abuse that he went through, the beatings and the imprisonments and the stonings, the things that came against his life proved the strength of his ministry. And he was doing it because he believed in the radicalness of the message. The message was world-changing. He was part of the Judea and Samaria, all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth. He was part of the great expansion. And the only way the great expansion could work is if the gospel was being preached with all authority. And Paul was standing his ground. And this church had been birthed, even though he'd been beaten in other places. He birthed this church the same way. He, he was beaten for it, but now there's a church. Somebody say hallelujah. We're going to find out because his vision was greater than his opposition. The vision of God that was in his spirit was greater than all the opposition. And because of that, he could take his position right there, right then, because something was greater than all that was going on inside his life. Look at this, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Somebody say complete it. Somebody say complete it. Somebody say complete it. Come on, you got to tell yourself complete it. You cannot complete what you will not run with. You cannot complete what you don't run it off with. You cannot complete if you look back. You cannot compete or complete if your eyes are set on the things that are behind you. Paul is telling them, God that started this thing with you is going to bring you all, somebody say all, all the way through. Church, we're not going to coast into the kingdom. We're going to run our race and run into the kingdom. Somebody say hallelujah. That's what God wants. It says, listen, he begun a good work in you, will complete it. That's a finished work with the ultimate goal of what God designed. All the way until the day of Christ Jesus, he will not let go of you. Verse 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart. Because both in my chains and in the defense and in the confirmation of the gospel, no matter what I went through, you stayed steadfast. Can we handle the opposition? Can we handle types of persecution? Can we handle those that say churches ought to be burned 
or Christians ought to be called terrorists. Hell, it's ought to shut you down in the workplace because you claim to be a child of God. Can we handle that type of beginning of persecution? Well, they don't want you to gather in church. And when you do, they want to find you. It didn't matter. They didn't lose faith and they didn't lose their purpose. Paul says, I, I believe God will finish it because you have never stopped. You didn't look back. You didn't go back. And because of that, I can trust that God's going to supply everything for you. Verse 19. <clears throat> and this reason why <clears throat> Paul can be so aggressive in this <clears throat> because Paul has got something on the inside <clears throat> sorry, that every believer needs. He's got a vision and the revelation of the king. Again, that's so much greater than his present circumstance. Paul has got such a revelation of God, so strong with the glory of God on the inside that nothing, nothing, nothing can outweigh what he's got on the inside. Nothing, nothing. Paul is so eternity-minded. Why? Because he's had glimpses. Let me say glimpses. He's had glimpses. He's been there. He has seen what the Lord wanted him to see. And because of that, he was horrifically a threat to the powers of darkness. Paul had vision. Somebody say vision. The closer you get with Jesus, the more the king can reveal to you of his kingdom and his authority. Yes, you become a threat, but you'll be so strong in the things of God because you want the greater one on the inside of you than he that's in the world where you are desperate and hungry for kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be met. Every need can be met because you are a kingdom seeker. And in that place, Paul was such a threat that it didn't matter his circumstances. He was so heavenly minded that the devil had no power over him in the earth. It says, now I know, even though I'm in prison, <clears throat> doesn't matter, because I know how faithful the Holy Ghost is, because I know he's not done, and I know you're praying. Somebody say praying. Now when we talk about praying, we're talking about mountain moving faith going out in the church. <clears throat> These were mountain movers. These were prayer warriors. They didn't have crump uh, crumpets and whatever and donuts afterward, which is okay, which is okay. If you really want to lead people to prayer, bring donuts in, but lock them up and make them pray or travail through before you open that cabinet. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to go there for a minute because some people cannot pray without donuts. Okay. <clears throat> oh, my gosh. <clears throat> for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer. I know the kind of prayer you're praying. I know the kind of authority you're using. And because of the supply of the Spirit of Christ, I know. <clears throat> Paul's in prison and he knows. I'm coming out. Somebody say, coming out. Yeah. Say it's not done yet. Okay. Paul's not writing his epitaph. He's preparing to move forward. He's not looking back. He's got the heart of heaven, and he knows. He can sense the intercession. He can sense the working of the Holy Spirit. He knows he's coming out, and he's ready to hit the ground running again. He says, I know the earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Verse 20, but in all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my being, whether by life or by death. Now, nobody wants to say by life or by death, but think about it. Paul was in that place. We do not understand, as Christians, the shedding of blood in opposition and persecution in this nation. We have no concept of real persecution. I don't want it. But there are nations of the world. People are thrown in, what, 12 foot by 12 foot cages. And that's where they'll be for years because they're a Christian. Or shorter cages because they're a Christian beaten and commanded to renounce their faith. And I'm not talking about 200 years ago. I'm talking about today, right now <clears throat> in the world. Paul had to make this radical decision because of the revelation of God. <clears throat> he said, by life or by death, I guarantee you the kingdom of God is going to be manifest in my being. So he's telling them, I ain't giving up. <clears throat> and he's saying this to encourage them. Paul is in prison saying, I'm not giving up. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to run my race. You can know it. I'm coming out, and I'm coming back, and we're going to continue running this thing. I'm excited about meeting with you. And yes, I, you have to go home to the glory or stay here. It's quite a toss. But I know, I know it is advantageous that I come forth, and we get together, and fellowship is connected once again. Paul knows that it is not done yet. He says, even though if I live in the flesh, verse 22 that means I can be from the fruit of my labor, yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. 
I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which I've seen, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful to you. Therefore, I'm confident of this. I know that I shall remain and I shall continue with you for your progress and for your joy of faith. I'm staying the course. I will not look back. So Paul, as he writes this letter, because of what he's been through the birth of the church, imagine a father's heart, a parent's heart. The heart of Paul with the heart of the Holy Spirit to see you succeed. People get offended over the smallest things and they throw everything away because they're offended in the smallest thing. Here Paul has been beaten, shipwrecked, imprisoned, lied about, falsified, and yet his attitude is, I'm ready to run this race. Going home to be with Jesus isn't because I'm a coward. It's because I've seen him. That's why. I've seen his splendor. And oh, to go back from when I've had the chance to see. But I know I will be there. He will write to Timothy, I know there was a crown laid up in store for me. Hallelujah, I've run my race. I fought my fight. I'm finishing my course. But in, and it's coming close and I know what's coming. But until that day, he's going to run it because he knows people need to be connected to the king and to his kingdom. He wants your life effective. And are we, do we have the same spirit in us? So he challenges this church just to encourage them. Stand steadfast in the Holy Ghost and become one spirit. Notice verse 27. Let your conduct, he's telling them how to operate. Paul wants this church strong. We talked a little bit about this this morning. Church has got to be strong on the inside if you can be effective on the outside. He wants the church to be strong and steadfast. So under the anointing and the calculation of the Holy Ghost, they can begin to expand and expand. Somebody say and expand. And expand and expand and expand and expand. So he needs them to be winning constantly. Somebody say winning. Church, we got to win constantly constantly. So he tells them, here's what I need you to do. I need to let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or I am absent, I'm going to hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of this powerful, victorious message. And not in any way terrified, be anxious for nothing, you he, he's preparing them, and not in any ways terrified about your adversaries, which is to them a proof of their judgment. What does that mean? When the devil is moving and we're shouting and praising, when the world is hating and we're walking in the kingdom love of God, every time we stand in the principles of God's glory and God's grace, it is an ongoing declaration that we've won, that we've won that we've won. It's an ongoing declaration that we're going to go to glory and judgment's coming here. It's an ongoing declaration. That's why we don't have time to get offended. That's why we don't have time to fall away. Our ongoing statement of steadfastness is a constant declaration. It doesn't matter what hell tries to do. Hell is already going to hell. You're not. You're not. So he says, stand your ground. It's a declaration of the judgments of God, which means anybody that sees you standing your ground and is desperate for God is going to want everything you've got of God. You want to bring them out of the demonic? You want to bring them out of the world? <coughs> Sorry. Now you standing steadfast in your faith in the demonstration of God gets them to the position which, which he's about to tell you. So standing steadfast, number two, <coughs> verse five, Having the mind of Christ, so I'm going to stand steadfast together. Somebody say unified. Come on, unified. I would tell people all the time, and I went over to, when I went to South Africa, I met a whole bunch of pastors, got off the plane, couldn't hear out of one ear. The guy just dove the plane. I swear to heavens, the guy had a scarf around his neck, said, yeah, and just dove right out of the sky and yanked up just enough to plop that thing on the ground. Walked out of the airplane, oh my God, you know. No wonder they're all rickety dickety things over there, all busted up, you know, who knows, you know. I come off the plane, and all these pastors are running up to me. I mean, I didn't know any of them. And they're all, all hugging and touching. And they all, and they all, this was a one accord. And I realized when I began to speak with them in the broken languages that we all had the same heart. There was such a spirit of unity. They just, 
they were just so excited. So then I got excited. Then my ear popped open. Then I could hear everything they were saying. And I was even more excited. But we walked in a one accord. It wasn't like I had no idea who these people were, and I'd never met them. But we were instantly friends in the Holy Ghost. Instantly. So he says, verse 5, and let this mind be in you. The governing authority in the church has to be the mindset of Jesus Christ. And when we look at this, and I began speaking on this, because we got to think, how did Jesus think as he walked? What was the faith in him? What was the heart that is in him? How did he connect and relate with his father? What was his position? And with that mindset controlling who we are, then the old things got to go, the fearful things got to go, the dismaying things got to go. But how Christ himself moved forward knowing he was going to be victorious and he confronted the flesh nature, he confronted his enemies, he confronted his adversaries, and he finished his course. The Bible says, let this mind be in you. Who knew who he was. You know who you are in Christ? Do you really understand your position now that he's ascended to the right hand of power? You are seated in heavenly places in him. You got the right to have the kingdom and the authority and the heart and the mindset of God conducting and controlling your affairs. Paul wants the church to walk supernatural. He wants them to get into one accord, one spirit, but also walk under the authority and the anointing of the mind of Christ, knowing who you are. It says in verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And the Bible's attitude is we walk in humility, but we walk in the bold strength of heaven. Jesus went all the way, why can't we? Is there a clause at the end of your Christianity? Is there a clause that says somewhere, I'll only go this far with Jesus and then I'm done? Where is your clause? Do you have one? And if you do, you will fall far short of the glory of God. You will never accomplish the things of heaven. Because you've made a clause. You said, I will serve Jesus only to this point. <clears throat> I will not go any farther. And here, <clears throat> they said the mind of Christ was all the way. Somebody say all the way. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what all the way means. Are we ready for that, believers, to really sit down when we've been into the comfort zone of church and say, what does it mean to go all the way with God? Oh, we say it, we sing it, we witness, somebody, get, you know, somebody gets offended, then we run home. All the way is simply all the way. And it says, therefore, because he went all the way, God highly exalted him, gave him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every of those things in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And because our king went all the way, we have the authority of his name. And he's telling this church, in the midst of this all, know who you are. And in this place, are you still with me here? Give me a few more minutes. In this place, look at verse 12. You make a decision to strive forward. Somebody say, strive forward. Okay, why are you here? Why are you tuning in? Are you here to get fed or entertained? What are you here for? Why are we in the house? To fulfill an obligation? Notice what the Bible says here. This is important now. Because everything is changing in the body of Christ. The church needs to change. We need to know the distinction. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Now, this does not mean, for all of you chasing down the LGBTQ community and saying, work it out according to that. No. It means the position of God's kingdom and his glory specifically in and through your life. What is God's calling? How is his placement in the body? His standards are absolute holiness. But you are called to run your race. Why? Because your race is one-on-one -on -one with God. How are you going to run the holiness of heaven? How are you going to walk in the victory of God? How is the kingdom of God going to pour through you? How is the strategies of 
heaven going to operate in your life? How are you going to flow together as believers? See, it's not a bunch of machines. It is you uniquely connected. And that local body having to know the specific heart and calling of God. Work it out. What is God's plan? You have to engage the matter. And it says, work out your own salvation with great fear and trembling. That means with honest and true, genuine respect. And it says, because, for it is God. And the Bible says the word works here is the action. It is the work of God's kingdom and his grace. God working. Somebody say working. I am in the work of God. I am a work of God. And we're in the moving forward work of God. And it says, for it's God who works in you. Heaven is moving. So he says, in that position of God, he wants the church to be moving and working it out. How is the Holy Ghost wanting to move and demonstrate? Work out your own salvation with fear. And that means the fear of God and full expectation. Because he says, God works in you. To will and to do his. Somebody say his. Let me say his. His. His pleasure. It's a whole new day. God's, God's work of kingdom is in us. Keep going, verse 14. Do all things without complaining and dispute, so that you may become blameless and harmless. The word harmless is not that you become soft and grumbly, but you become innocent. That's pureness of heart. So you can be truly affected, so that you be so that you become blameless and innocent as children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you shall shine brightly as lights in the world. Therefore you are to hold fast the word that's been poured into you. Paul poured it into that church. He needs them to hold to the kingdom. Somebody say kingdom. Listen, God's word is not changed. Holiness is holiness. Without holiness, no more shall see the Lord. Everyone is called and appointed into the kingdom of God, but we got to stand in the steadfast of the, of the heart and the strategy and the purity of his kingdom. His kingdom is not diverse. It's the same kingdom. So he tells them, you need to hold fast the word of, somebody say life, that is life producing, so that I may rejoice on the day when I enter glory and you enter glory and I see you all entering glory because you stood steadfast. And listen, Paul gave it all. And he poured the very heart of heaven. And to see them victorious is triumphant. Let me bring it down. Therefore, verse 8, chapter 3. Let go of your past. And let, and I put it in here, let go of your past gladly. Let go of your past gladly. Let go, Paul says, I had all these things that I could claim to fame. But he says, I count them all as nothing but a loss. So that I may embrace something that I could never embrace. If I'm hanging on to my past, I can never embrace the power and the kingdom and the glory and the virtue of God. He says, so that I may know for the excellency of what? What is the word he says here? The excellency of what? The knowledge of God. Is that what he says? Look at it. I, so I care all things lost so that I may know the excellency of the knowledge of God. But what do I get with the knowledge of God? Verse 3 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter says, His divine power has given me everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So by the knowledge of God, he understands everything, the divine nature and divine power of God. By having the knowledge of God, he gets the divine presence of God. That's why it says, let go of your past, gladly. Because the knowledge of God brings the divine presence of God. And in that, he had the genuine righteousness of God. So he could have, verse 10, resurrection power and fellowship with God. Therefore, two more. Now did you forget your past gladly. And not only did you let go of your past gladly, sorry, jump ahead, but you forget your past. I want the knowledge of God. I want access to the divine nature of God. Paul's walking in this. And he knows if the church will stand steadfast, unified in this way, it will be victorious. So not only let go of your past and let go of it gladly, 
But he says, then he says, he has to go on the audacity to say, forget your past. Somebody say, forget. forget. Yeah, but no, forget it. Yeah, but no, forget it. I'm going to say it again, forget it. <laughs> forget it. That's right, forget it. You got it. Not that I've already attained. Can you say forget it? Can you honestly let go and forget your past and not keep reaching back to put your hand on it? Can you honestly trust the Holy Spirit? Paul had to do that. And he said it again and again and again and again. I am crucified with Christ. I put my flesh to death daily, I die. I fight my fight and I run forward. I call it all but dung and refuse. And then I do this. Not that I've already obtained everything. I know that I'm perfected. But I do something. Somebody say, do something. People so quick to say, well, you know, I'm just a failure and I'm no good. Well, then suck it up and press on. I'm sorry. This is the time of war here. I'm no good. No, actually, you're not. Not without Christ. You are worthless. Anyways, <clears throat> you need Jesus then. Paul says, I'm not perfected, but I press on. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Where was that at? For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And, and here's what the image is. God putting his hand on your shoulder. I want to lay hold of what God has laid hold of me with. God has put his hand on the shoulder of my life. And I want to put my hand on him and on the goal that he has set forward in my life. God has put his hand on me. And I want to put my hand on God's hand. That's what the heart here is. I may, I may have messed up and I may not be perfect, but one thing, I've made a decision. Somebody say, suck it up. I've made a decision. Somebody say, suck it up. Suck it up. I've made a decision that whatever God laid hold of me for, I'm going to lay hold of that. I do not count myself as having done it all, but one thing I do, verse 13, what? I forget those things that are behind me. Stand your feet in the house. Unless you can let go, willingly and willfully. Now, I'm going to speak this over some people right now. You've had problems going on in your life for years. There's just somebody who wants, who wants prayer. If you need prayer, please get that up to us now, and I will pray for that right here on the air. You've been spending your almost your entire life with something that's been holding you back, an offense, a hurt, Somebody did something, something happened, and you keep going back to that and going back to that and going back to that. Well, you can't be effective for God until you let go of that. Yeah, but I don't know how Jesus knows how. He's had to break that thing off to you because you're afraid of a future that you don't know about. The problem is you become comfortable in that thing that's behind you. I don't know if I have giraffes in the room now, too. And we're back overseas. Okay. Well, it could be for another country. Um, <laughs> we just move our ministry anywhere. We could be all things to all people. All right, now thank you for that. Um, you need to let go. I will pray for you to let go. You got to make a decision. Forget your past. Do not go back. It's a tough thing to let the Holy Spirit really have it. And the reason why people are afraid because they got, they got their hand on their past because that's their comfort zone. That's what it is. We're afraid. Because we don't know. But here, I just gave you the word here. God has put his hand on you for your future. Put a hand on you for your assignment right here, right now in the body of Christ. If he put his hand on you, it doesn't matter. If God before you, who could be against you? See, it's hell itself and a thing that's hurt you that keeps telling you you have to stay engaged. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. You need to let the Holy Spirit root that garbage out. Paul said, yeah, I got a past. He was a religious past. He actually was a murderer. 
He could walk around with guilt and shame of everything that he did when he imprisoned Christians. He's not making up for it. So God laid his hands on him by mercy and grace and is using him. And Paul has been running that race and he's not let his past have power over him. Either side. And he calls it but dumb. It's nothing. My race I'm running is because of the revelation of God. And I'm excited about entering his kingdom. See, Paul walked in guilt. He'd be thinking about hanging his head. Did I do good enough? Have I made up for my past? Have I made up for my sins? Did I do all right? Is there still an entrance into the kingdom? He had none of that. It was done under the blood, washed away. He is excited about his future. He has seen his future. He's walked with the master. No condemnation. So he's excited about where he's going. Lift your hands up before the Lord in the house. You're someone who actually sent something up. This is Sarah. And she says, for anything that is holding me back, I want it to be removed. I want to run my race of faith. I want God's plan. Well, Sarah, we are in agreement with you right now. In the name of Jesus. Girl, we speak the kingdom of God over you right now to shatter anything holding you back. It's broke. It's like a glass hitting the ground and shatters and everything spreads out. You cannot get it back ever again. I declare that glass is shattered and that thing is broke across the floor and you are loosed and liberated from the power of your past right now as we speak the word and you are liberated for the kingdom of God to use you right now in the assignments of heaven and the plan that God has put his hand on your life for. And Father, I give you the praise for it. I see that thing shatter on the floor. And for others of you in the same place, Put all them like glasses. Think of all like glasses full of water. And just in the name of Jesus, shatter them all. We're not turning them over. We're shattering the glasses. And once they're shattered, they're useless. And everything in them is spilt and can never be brought back. Father, I speak just deliverance over the people of God. For the years that you've been in bondage, the years you've been held back, the years that the devil has tried to get out in your life, this is your moment. Say, my moment. This is your moment. That's why you're here. The kingdom of God for such a time as this. Let the conviction of the Holy Spirit say, "Uh uh-uh. My plans and my purposes for you have not changed. All you got to do is let God listen to his voice. Today is the day of today. You hear his voice and harden not your heart. Today is the beginning of the rest of your life. If you're willing to let him, today is the first day of the rest of your purpose, your assignment right here, right now in the kingdom of God. And I speak that thing being lifted off you. You can let it go without guilt and condemnation. Loose it and let it go. All of it shattered to the floor. You are a child of the most high God. Your king has rescued you. He has put his hands on you and he is calling you to the kingdom for such a time as this. Your king has forgiven you completely. Somebody yell hallelujah. Your king has let you go. Now you can tell the devil you're done. You're done with my life. Now you need to have a whole new confession. Paul says, I forget those things that are behind, but I press for the mark, the high call of God in Christ Jesus. And look, if it's in the word, that means it's for you. You put your name in now, since everything is, I'm not, I may not have obtained it, I got it, but I, but I, Sarah, whoever you are, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I now forget all the power of my past, all things that are behind me, and the word reaching forward here means with both hands. When both hands are doing this, You can't have one hand on your past. Somebody say both hands. That's what this means. Both hands. You're in the house today. We're going to minister. And you want the power of that past that broke off your life. Now when I pray that, you're going to let it go. 
We're going to pray the word of God over you. If that's you, come on down front. I want to pray with you. Listen, we love you here at Standing in the Word Ministries. Our goal is to see the kingdom of God advanced in your life. No matter where you are across the nation or across the world, pastors all over, we speak the victory of God over you and the power of that past that's been on your life is being shattered, defeated off you, your congregation, your people. I speak the kingdom of God moving completely through you. It's your moment. If you let God be God in your life, that is how we do it. And Father, I give you the praise for now in the radical name of Jesus and everybody said amen and amen.